if you're paying attention, it's like you know things have to change, right? And, and there's going, there are going to be companies that come out there to kind of challenge conventional wisdom, think about new ways of doing things, and then, and then being able to actually deliver on it. That's that's what coalition is. So what I uh, what I thought we would do here, we'll keep it loose. And so keep in mind, this is a this is a great opportunity if you like, open, if you have questions, or you want to throw something out, or you're thinking about something. I want, to, I want to make sure that you have a chance to, to answer those questions. But Shay, I just want to start with you. Number one, I think it's, you have an interesting background, right? So you came from AIG and Aon. So I want you to ex explain how you got connected with these guys and thinking like a carrier and then hearing this, telling them they're crazy and then kind of how it all came together. So maybe yeah. you could just start off with that and a little history, of back history of coalition. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you, John. Thank you all for being here tonight as well. Appreciate it and good to meet you all. Um, Coalition came about through, we have two founders, um, two Silicon Valley kind of brains. Um, and I was in the insurance industry. I thought I'd be a banker in New York and went to go find a job. And everybody said, Shay, you're amazing after you get your Harvard Business School degree. And I was like, oh geez, I'm never gonna get that. So I ran out of money after two weeks. So I thought I'd had two months, had two weeks. I got a job at a company called AIG. I didn't even know what it stood for, American International Group at the time. And they said, you got to go do DNO insurance. I did that. I've been in the insurance world since then doing uh, private equity, M&A, tax reps and warranties, all sorts of kind of very specific, unique insurance. And an old client calls me up um, two and three years ago now. And he said, Shay, I want to start a cyber insurance company. And he was a private equity client of mine. I thought, no offense, Josh, he's our founder um, and CEO, Joshua Mata. He's a Kansas City guy, actually. And he's like, Shay, it's, we need it. We need cyber insurance. So I was like, no offense, Joshua, but you're a private equity guy. Like, you don't know the insurance world. You're never going to succeed. And by the way, there's like 100 cyber insurance companies already. So why would you get into a market that's oversaturated? And he says to me, well, here's my idea. I want to do insurance and security together in one. And I was like, that's interesting. That's very interesting. And he's like, why is it? And, and our co-founder is a guy by the name of John Herring. John Herring's an entrepreneur, Silicon Valley guy, security guy. He was the leader of DEF CON for the past 10 years. It's a big uh, private, um, private, excuse me, hacker, like white hat hacker community. Out of, uh, they do it out of Vegas. And they do these hacking competitions. So John and, and Josh had come together and they realized there was this problem in the industry. And you've got this massive world of security, right? This massive security world selling fear and loathing every second of the day. And then you've got this massive five trillion dollar insurance world. And they were like, why don't we combine the two? Because the problem with security today is they're really good at selling you what kind of software do you need? What kind of hardware do you need? We'll protect you. Don't worry. We got it. A million dollars later, you're like, oh, I'm set. I'm secure. I guarantee you it's never secure, right? When was the last time you watched a what season are we in? We're in baseball. When was the last time you saw a baseball game that tied zero to zero? Never, actually. Never, right? Why is that? Because that's the way the world works. Human beings are incredibly good at solving problems and working ways around and, solve and, and learning how to succeed. So you always hit runs. You always score touchdowns. It's just the way the world works. Hackers will always get in your network. Always. It's just a matter of time. Okay, so the, the misalignment that John and Josh realized was hey, there's a multi-trillion dollar security industry selling you this stuff. How motivated are they to help you when it goes wrong? <clears throat> How many have experienced this in this room? Right, you know, what the phone, you know what the phone call is? First of all, it's a terrible phone call. Second of all, it's even a worse answer. The answer is, I hope you have good insurance. And then you're like, I could buy insurance for cyber breaches? I didn't even know that, right? Like, there's, this world has advanced so rapidly. The motivation for a security company to help you get out of the situation is zero. They'll charge you 10x what they charge you to install it, right? I'm, look, there's a lot of professions that are amazing at what they do. Why though is there no alignment of interest? In the insurance world, on the other hand, five trillion dollar industry, 1.5 trillion dollars in the United States alone. You have all these big companies that have been around for, they actually been around for 400 years. It's a long time, right? Like. They've been around forever, since shipping and all these other worlds, okay? That's where they kind of started. And they're not, they don't even know how to code anything. They couldn't code a, a, a website in HTML to show you, like, you know, how a, how a little Peppa Pig runs from one side of the screen to the other, right? They just don't know technology. 
they have these trillion dollar balance sheets. So you've got the security world who knows everything about technology. You've got the insurance world who knows everything about solving problems, getting you back up on your feet after an event. The problem is there's no in between. Okay, so coalition was created. John and Josh created it Not with the nice. idea. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you would be, you would be here. Yeah, little small commission. It kind of was. John yeah, indirectly. John yeah, John and John and Josh. Yeah. And so that's why we created this business because we're highly aligned. Our alignment is to protect you, not just when the event happens, but before that. The 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 minority report idea. Before you're about ready to open that attachment that you think is coming from John Lovell. It isn't on level, right? We'll stop you from doing that. Okay, that's the idea. And no insurance company in America is doing that today. So the whole concept is, let's bring, to put it in technology terms, it's insurance as a service. I don't want to sell you a piece of paper like this, right? John and, and the level team, right? They're really good at selling this piece of paper and it's worked okay for the past 400 years of insurance history. But now we need more because cyber is changing every second, every day, every, Every minute, security is being breached in some hardware service or um, some, some kind of hardware OS operating system where people think they're secure. It changes so quickly that we need to adapt as an industry, and that's what we're trying to do at Coalition. Yeah. So Jessica and Dwayne, uh, you guys are the ones that brought Coalition to us, and which is one of the things we love working with you guys yep. as new products come on. You know, just promote them to us. You vet them, you look at them, you understand them, and then you say, I think this is a really viable option. And of course, when you guys gave me the report, I was just like, ah, oh, this is amazing, right? So yeah. um, talk just a little bit about uh, when you first had cyber insurance kind of hitting the market, and the wild, I call it the Wild Wild West, they're trying to kind of figure that out, and how it's changed from then to now, and then maybe what, you know, how it went from there to here with Coalition and, and some of the other other carriers that may be out there doing some of these things. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll go back to the, probably to the mid-2000s. I mean, I, I, Shay hit, hit upon it a little bit where, you know, if you wanted a cyber quote back in the uh, mid-2000s, it was, it was a stack of papers, a application, get your IT department involved. It was probably going to be a 45 to an hour minute conference call, which was just going to be mind-numbingly just horrible experience and on the offshoot that you sold the account did you have the right coverage in place people didn't know and uh shay, shay hit upon uh earlier the the sophistication of these of these hackers and the, the bad guys as we call them is i mean it's it's unbelievable and as an industry we do a bad job of we can't be out in front of these guys because they are so sophisticated they're thinking of things that we cannot think of so you know back back then it was one of those we didn't know the products that well we didn't know the exposures even worse so coming to the mid you know 2000 early 2010s if you want to call it the process the premiums and the uh the level of coverage got more streamlined so we started looking at first party and third party coverages to where we could we could talk to clients about the product just and real quick Explain the difference between first party and third party from a cyber, okay. cyber perspective. So I'll break it down very easily. So a third, so your first party coverage is going to be expenses that you incur as a result of a breach or a, an event. Third party is going to be expenses or the liabilities that you incur to a third party, whether it's a vendor or a client, more or less. So think of it in terms of... Uh, I have your information and right. you're my third party, you're my client. Yeah. Yep. Or if, so you're, the third if, you're, party. if people got access or their, their data was exposed, you'd have to actually pay to monitor their credit for a couple of years. Correct. Um, you might have to, um, but there's other, uh, not just monitor the credit, but you'd have to, uh, what's the other? Notification. You know, notification costs. Yeah. So yeah. so I think that's where like it's easy for people to understand that. So when you think of the big hacks that have happened, you think of the first party expenses. Like, well, I don't have many, you know, I don't have many clients, right? You know, I have like 10 employees. and. You know, really, what's the exposure there if I have to notify them? So I think we'll get into a little bit of that where it's, 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 it's bigger than you may think you can, know, just because you're a small business. But, can, I, yeah. can I jump in yeah. there real quick, yeah. too, yeah. just on the, on the kind of state of the world and the hacking mm -hmm. world? If we look at the history and how it's evolved, because this is important, because a lot of the small businesses around the world, in the Western world anyway, don't think they have an exposure. And what's happened is... We have, we have a handful of CIA and NSA former hackers who were literally destroying physically, digitally, every way, shape, or form enemies of the United States for the past decade. They're very good at 
getting it anywhere they want, and they never failed at a mission. Okay, so all the stuff you see on CNN and Fox and everywhere else, like about China and Russia, the U.S. is just as big as and bad as they are. You just never hear about it. Okay, just to put that aside. You we're doing a lot of the same things. You were, they, like, guess where they learned? Yeah, like, we're getting mad. They learned it from us. Okay. Six minutes special re recently, right? Yeah. Right. So like, that guy. Yeah. So don't forget hard. that, right? Just to make you sleep a little easier at night. Um, but the but the what's happened is there were there literally we think probably there's ten thousand human beings on this planet that are world class hackers because it takes a very unique mind and and th thought process. What happened over time was in the early 2000s, like Dwayne was saying, there, there, it was cool to hack into Apple. It was cool to hack into CIA, all these big targets. It was like an ego trip. There was no money involved, right? Because it, it was just to show how good you were. It, it was like war games, right? Remember in the, in the, the so Matthew Broder film, yeah, game. right? Like it was all just about ego, okay? What happened though is of course that got harder and harder as the companies adapted and learned to defend against that you know, ex post that they would run and, and they'd stop the, they'd stop a touchdown with their safety moving left a little bit, right? That adjustment would happen very quickly. So then they're like, well, now this is difficult and I'm, now I'm 30 years old, I'm a grown up, I'm an adult, I've got a wife, I've got kids, I've got a life. I can't go spend my entire week hacking into these organizations. I'm just gonna weaponize it. I'm gonna sell the hacking pieces that I can find in any term like in a, some sort of industrial control system, like a Siemens generator, a Microsoft Outlook, a RDP from Microsoft, whatever it is, they'll just sell it in the dark web. Now they're hacking, but they're making money, right? They sell it to, to hackers all over the world. So now you have those 10,000 people now become 10 million people who now have the shovels to go dig and look for gold. And what's happened is they're not clever enough to get into the CIA or, or Disney or Netflix or any of these other places. So they go to the low hanging fruit, which is the small businesses of the world. Okay, so what used to be just, oh, I'm a, I'm a plastics, uh, I make floor mats for trucks, right? Rubber floor mats for trucks, I'm not exposed. The industrial control systems that stamp those rubber mats for you every day are connected by Wi-Fi and they're controlled by a really crap software system that has one password and the password is password. Okay, it takes a hacker about 10 seconds to figure out how to turn you off and hold your entire business for ransom. Okay, so that's important to think about. 25% of companies in America buy cyber insurance today. Last year, according to Verizon data, 2018, of all the targeted attacks of all the companies in the United States, which the government tracks, 62% were targeted at small businesses. That's defined as companies under 250 million in revenue. 62%, okay? Of that 62% that were targeted, 65%, okay, that's more than two thirds, were out of business in 18 months. Look at that, we've got three tables. Two of you tables leave the room and how many do we have left? Think about that for a second. Think about how many towns that affect, how many families that affect, how many businesses that affect. That's pretty scary. What, what drove them out of business? So like, think about it from those terms. Like, so yeah. what, was, what was the financial loss to a group like that? Like, yeah, so literally it was, it was, they turned off that system that stamps the rubber mats. I don't know how to make rubber mats. I'm not a manufacturer guy, but let's just say that that was a business and that's what you did. And now your systems are held ransom unless you pay these hackers 10,000 Bitcoin. And you're like, oh, no, they're not real. They're real. And you don't pay it. And then finally you figure out a way to pay it and you gotta notify all your customers, you gotta notify all your vendors, you gotta do all these things. Before you know it, after the half million dollars of Bitcoin payment, you have a half, another half million dollars of notification costs and lawyer's fees, and four years later, 18 months later, according to the data, you don't have any more money in the bank. That's to, what happens. Uh, to take that a step further, let's say you're a service industry, industry like an accountant or an attorney. Let's say your clients knew that you got hacked. How apt are they to use you going forward? probably not so much. So you're gonna lose revenue from clients that knew that you had an, had an event or knew that their information could be exposed. So it's a loss, of, it's a business income loss that can be covered through cyber insurance. We can quantify that as well, that it, companies hit a lot, especially on the retail side too, and service industry, because they've known that you've been hacked before. They're not as apt to use you going forward. I think the because I think what's interesting, like what we wanted to try and 
accomplish here was we always hear about the, the big hacks, right? You know, whether right. it's uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield or Marriott. Uh, Marriott. Yeah. Um, and Target had one. Uh, Target. I don't know how long ago it was, but do you know how Target ago. was infiltrated or hacked? Through a subcontractor that was doing work for, uh, for one of their locations. And uh, somehow, through correspondence back and forth, invoicing or whatever, Hacker was like, holy crap, this little subcontractor is working for Target, got right in and, and blew that whole thing up. So, um, is everybody scared to death now? I mean, is this what the, the purpose of what we're doing now? <laughs> it's work. I think, I think Need the another drink? Is, you think <laughs> yeah. about what we insure today, right? Yeah. I mean, it's whether it's your vehicles or your property or whatever. It's like, okay, I don't want to expose myself to that loss uh, because it would be detrimental to my business, right? Correct. Well, now, in, in how we do business, um, this is why we are supplementing with insurance because it can be uh, too much to, to bear or overcome if you are exposed or hacked in, in some way, shape, or form. Because the metric that we used to use early on was like, okay, how many records do you have on file in your office, right? And that's how we would think. It'd be like, okay, and it's about seventy dollars per record. It's like, well, I only have like ten employees. Like, oh, well, you're, you know, seven hundred dollars exposure. Well, no, that's just not. That's not how it works anymore. And so the other thing, and, and, and uh, this, I'm going to segue into this too because I think this is very important. Is that when we go to the ENS market, there is a contract that's placed before us, right? Whether it's EPLI or it's uh, professional liability or whatever. But since it's in the ENS market, it is you know it's their contract and it's their form. And why we lean so heavily on them is that there are certain things that we are that are material to those policies, like an employment practice liability policy or even a cyber policy. But until now. It was hard to get a cyber policy that said, we'll just like coalition. Yeah. And what we're going to show you is this is like kind of a brief example of their form. It's like, it's everything. It's not this little bolt on add on that, that you know, gives you a little bit of coverage over here or a little bit of coverage over here. It's saying, it's saying like, this is how confident we are in what we do. And here's our form and everything that's being covered under. And so let me, let me circle back too. So, you know, for a long time, we had the markets. We did a lot of London business, and we we're like, "Hey, life's great. We got our cyber markets. We're set." All of a sudden, Jessica comes to my office and says, "Hey, we're going to meet with Coalition." I'm like, "Who?" She's like, "Come in the meeting." I'm like, "I didn't want to, but I'm like, all right, let's go." And then we met Shay, and we did the meeting, blew our socks off, and we're like, "But I was skeptical. I was like, if this guy can produce what he's saying, we're in." And so, like. Literally, we ran a couple accounts by, by John, and it was legit. And I was like, John, here, here's the product. Let's go. And this is a terrible uh, <laughs> slide. You can't really read it, which is good, which is how most contracts from insurance carriers are. You can't read it <laughs> or understand it, uh, which is it's, it's big. Sorry, Doug. By the way, we do have a, one of our great carrier partners, uh, Doug Coleman with Liberty Mutual, who is Kind enough to give me my first carrier appointment, so it's not going to be too hard on, on, the, <laughs> on the insurance guys. But uh, and I don't think you're going to be able to read it. But can you zoom in? Uh, kind of, not really. Let me try it. If I take it out of this, I can. Can you read it at all? Yeah, that's a bit better. Yeah. yeah. So I think what's uh, well, well, we'll get more into this because it, I think it was pretty cool. Uh, but here's your insuring agreement, and it's pretty simple, right? So, uh, like, talking about the, the network and information security liability, regulatory defense and penalties, multimedia content liability, PCI fines and assessment, um, and then if you keep going down, there's uh, the breach response, crisis management, cyber extortion, business interruption, um, digital asset restoration, funds transfer. So you see a, a lot of different things that are picked up here. Uh, we've got your deductible on the side and then the supplement that's over there. Um, without going too far into the weeds here, just uh, uh, Shay or, or Dwayne or even Jessica, like just, you know, network and information security liability right there. So like the million dollar supplement, like what is that picking up for uh, someone from a third party liability? Coverage? That's your typical third party liability. When people think of cyber liability, they're thinking about this coverage, which is, um, Basically, you have a breach and you have a financial loss due to the breach because a third party is suing you. So that's maybe if you have like a BOP or some sort of add-in, you might have a small sublimit just for that coverage only. Multimedia content liability. So that's for um, on your website to protect you from um, suits for libel, slander, any sort of content that you're putting on there that um, that 
you know, might cause Thank someone you. to get upset, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Regulatory defense, I skipped over that in penalties, but that's, I mean, that's pretty self explanatory as right. far as, yeah. uh, you know, the, the governing bodies that might jump in. And because you were negligent in, in protecting information or data, there could be some uh, penalties that are involved with that. Um, PCI fines, so that's like the payment card processing, right. which is, this is interesting, but go ahead and expound on that a little bit. It's a payment card industry, so if you accept payment cards, you are subject to follow their guidelines and their rules and regulations. And should you have a breach, and you have not followed those, then you will be, you know, you will be f fined by them, um, subject to s forensic investigations, and have to produce a lot of uh, information and evidence for them. And this, this would help you pay for that. I don't see and many of my restaurant operators in here, but uh, in fact, I don't see any of them. But. Uh, <laughs> The common misconception is that if you're using a third-party credit card processor, like, oh, well, I've got some group that processes all that, is that it's not my deal, but let me just tell you firsthand from the client's experience is it is your deal. And all it takes is uh, someone, a credit card company, uh, reporting you to FBI or another government agency and says, hey, we think some of our credit card information was exposed to this restaurant group. And then guess what? They hit you, and you got to go do a forensic analysis. And even though there was nothing there that showed that they had a breach, it was a $75,000 expense that was picked up by their insurance to cover it. So something to think about is that everyone always thinks, well, it's like we're running credit cards, but that's somebody else. Um, you're still uh, liable or obligated uh, legally to take care of that. So I won't get, I won't go through many more of these. We actually have an example of this if you want to look through it, but. If you saw a typical one, which I think is what's interesting in this, like you wouldn't see, I mean, you might see half of, uh, of some of those things picked up. And so that's what to me is so amazing with this form is that, is that it's so robust and it's, uh, it's so inclusive of all the different exposures or, or, or losses that you might be exposed to during a breach. Um, and there's a reason for that. And that's because what you're doing throughout the course of the year. So talk yeah. a little bit about how yeah. it, it's the cybersecurity piece. So you're the insurance piece, but now talk about what you're doing throughout yeah, this, the year at Monitor. That's right, John, that's exactly right. So the, the, when I told you guys in the beginning how we started the whole concept of combining the insurance and the security together, there's two parts that. There's the front end where we actually underwrite. Okay, no offense to the current carriers in the marketplace, but <laughs> they don't underwrite. Yeah, Generally speaking, generally speaking, they don't underwrite specific risk, right? All of your business owners, you want an insurance policy that mimics your risk, right? Just like you're a driver, you drive a car. You're much, one of you guys drives at 60 miles an hour in a 30 mile per hour zone. One of you drives 20 miles an hour in a 30 mile per hour zone. You both pay the same insurance, right? That's ridiculous. Somebody should, the, the 60 mile an hour should pay a lot more. We actually analyze the network, okay? Our scan, which is, we still from the NSA, <clears throat> but it basically it's is really, really good at finding- government agency, they're just Yeah, you, so. yeah they're just, they've, <laughs> I'm gonna be arrested any minute now. Um, there, you can look at vulnerabilities with it just remotely, okay? I don't need to come into this room, I can stand right there on the street and look through the glass and figure out what's going on in this room. That's all we do. We don't come into the room and take note of what's going on, but we can see what's going on. Okay, that's exactly what we do every single quote. Every single time we underwrite a risk, we look at what kind of domains you've got, what kind of services you're running on there, what kind of apps are you running, what kind of e-commerce software are you running, what kind of server is hosting your, your web uh, site, all of these things. We gather basically 30,000 data points within about a quarter of a second. Okay, that's the algorithm. That algorithm doesn't just help us identify the risk in the first, on the front end, which, by the way, if we identify a vulnerability, if you're running, like Target was running an old version of Apache Stretch software, it's a, it's a server communication software, they were running a three version old Apache Struts. They spend like $25 million a year in cybersecurity and they were running an old version of their software, total F for not good work, right? They got breached because of that. If we see that you're running the same thing on your network, we're going to notify you and say, hey, this is not good. You need to update this. Okay? Not only that, we'll place the policy with you. The, our good friends at RT and Level will, will get it set up so that you guys are comfortable with it. We'll fix that, that, get that uh, three version old software you're running. Okay? Then every single day, every single evening, we monitor our entire portfolio. We run the exact same scan. 
if we find that, let's just say, I'm making this up, but let's just say you're all running the same semen stamping machine, let's just run with that analogy, okay? And we know that it's being breached, that software, that operating software, that firmware that's being, that runs those control systems, has, somebody's figured out how to breach it in South Africa tonight, and we see that, and we run a portfolio scan, and we see that 30% of our manufacturers are running the exact same software, we notify all of you via email saying, hey, this is a serious vulnerability, here's how you can fix it. How do you run that every night? It's a computer. It never, oh, it never turns on. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, <laughs> I do insurance. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. You push a button and kind of just, just runs. To, to, like, I think it's always important. Um, so a new client that, yep. that we brought on, uh, that same thing. So we ran the network uh, scan. Uh, yep. We went in and presented them. Uh, they had never been a, a cyber client before. Um, you know, just kind of walk through the different things that, that, that I was going to cover. And, and, and law firms, in, in my opinion, are are very susceptible because of um, the, just think of the client base, even if um, you know, you're small firm data. and all the different clients yeah. and, and matters and inf yeah. information that you have, but you guys told us when we went to the meeting, is like, by the way, you have this VPN that's exposed. You're a little conference, like right now in this conference room, when we're sitting there, like someone could be watching us do this because this is not parked behind the firewall. So if you told us that, we sent that to them in the meeting, showed them the report, and then the the, the, the Gallagher sent with, she mm -hmm. just goes, oh my gosh, it's amazing. Are you serious? I was like, yeah. And then sure enough, she went back, checked it, fixed it, and, um, and and it was done. And they even, you know, that's the other cool thing, is offering them solutions to fix those those problems or those issues with your with your system uh, to keep you um, moving forward. And, and then later, the same client, I think that's a problem, so they, uh, <laughs> they sent us a notice and they just said, hey, this was the this is the red flag that's going on there, but it's always in your dashboard, it's like, here, you click this and this will help fix it, right? And so it's that constant monitoring to do, uh, to stay on top of those things. And we've seen it firsthand, so it's not just, it's not just this guy up here, Shay up here, just speaking like they do it. Like, I've seen it happen and I'm always very amazed that, that they're doing those things throughout the course of the year. Uh, to protect the business, just like we do with anything, the safety programs we offer, you know, for work comp or, or whatever it may be. Yep. These are things that they're doing on the cyber side that are that are that are very helpful to protecting your business from cyber exposures. Yeah, most um, most cyber policies, it's here's your policy. Let me know when something happens. These guys are, hey, we're going to protect you, and when something happens, we're going to protect you more. I mean, it's and, we, have, we have not seen that in the marketplace. And and the brokers in the room can attest to this. We're not charging for it. You'd think, sitting there in the audience, that we're going to be more expensive, right? Because we're bringing so much more to the table. Wow. I'm glad you finally brought that up because I was I was thinking that most of you must be thinking that your coverage is going to be really expensive with all of these uh, nuances that they're able to add. But actually, they are the most competitive carrier in the marketplace now. Well, just, so just think about it, though, from a business perspective. Mm -hmm. It's an incredibly self-serving interest, with all due respect. Absolutely. You don't want claims. They don't want claims. They took a risk for premium. It's a whole hell of a lot less expensive to help you not ever have a claim. And uh, just to add to what John said, we yep. put a client with uh, with you folks recently, one of mine. And these people have been in business since 1982. Mathematicians own them. You would think, and they have cyber people on staff. We got the report back and it said high vulnerability. And they're going to pay a premium that indicates they are highly vulnerable. These people just gasped when I brought that. Yeah. And I was thinking, holy shit, holy shit, I hope I don't offend them. Um, but my job is to help them. And they took it and said, thank you, we appreciate this. We're going to attack some of these things. Yeah. And they're making adjustments to because they have since they've been in business since 1982 and they do $10 million a year in revenues for gathering data so you can imagine the mass data they have. They said thank you, we're going to protect this in a different way. So it's, it's but it, but it, yeah, there's a fine line because it's working. You're showing their IT team exposures or weaknesses yeah. that they've been yeah. telling them that they can they, be awkward. That they yeah. well, it's, a, yeah. it's a little awkward, but yeah. you know what? Our job yeah. is to yeah. is to do something good. Yeah. And so, in that particular instance, it was there were good people. It was really well embraced. And uh, uh, but 
from a business perspective, there isn't anything smarter than what you're doing. Yep. Because you're you're making sure that your margins are as high as you want them to be. Mm -hmm. um, yep. And the other thing we always tell clients is, yes, we have this policy. It doesn't matter what coverage it is. I hope you never use it. It always costs to use a policy. It just does. Yep. And this is a mechanism that says, as few times as possible, we're going to make sure you use this policy. Yep. Well, and we fundamentally believe our mission as a business, and this is, this is quite a mission, uh, but I signed up to it, so I gotta make it happen, but our mission is to solve cyber risk. And if you think about that, that means a lot of things. And, and we, don't, we don't believe that it's fair that a company like Target or Marriott or these organizations should be able to spend tens of millions of dollars a year in cybersecurity and other companies just have to use an outsourced IT team that may or may not be any good. Yeah, I think that's the, that's the thing that also is, is opening eyes. It's like, what are you paying for your ID, IT department? So, so just uh, segueing from that, so like what's really cool and, um, is their cyber risk assessment. So if you, um, the way that they underwrite your risk is they simply get your domain. And we did this 30 minutes ago. So. Um, I hope Graham and Dunn doesn't mind that we, uh, they, there's nothing glaring on there, but literally they took the web address, they pinged it, and then they come back with this assessment. And so this is what we do for clients all the time. Um, it ends up uh, showing them places that they're weak or they're strong, but maybe Shay, you can just talk a little yep. bit about. So like your yep. first one is just kind of the overview of, uh, of what, uh, what coalition is for, and then, um, and then it kind of starts right here is, is where you rank um, yeah, we, we kind of put, it, it's pixelated, so I'll just talk you guys through it, but this, is, this was created about 40 seconds, 30 to 40 seconds after we create a quote, okay? So when Jessica and Dwayne and team, when they go in and create a quote for any given business, we give them the quote of insurance, which all the coverage is what you first saw, and we also give this risk assessment, totally free. Okay, this is like a $2,500 service if you got it in the open market today. Uh, Graham and Dunn's uh, restaurant business, as you can see, the 53rd percentile of all of our coalition policyholders, which isn't great, it isn't bad. Um, they've got two domains they're running. They've got one device, six applications, and three services. Um, we give some recommendations, which are traditional um, run DNA, DNSEC, DMARC. These are all security pieces. Let's go to the next page, and I'll show you. <clears throat> you can kind of skip through some of this until you get to here, okay? Right. This is, no, go, sorry, go back up to compromise yeah, credentials. Is the fun. Yeah, this, this is good. Is the fun one okay, you can't that. really see this very well, but you see the bold parts? Those, that, that word is password, okay? So what we do is we give the user account. So they're all email account. addresses within that organization. Email addresses, yeah. right, with that domain, okay? Whatever it is, Graham and Dunn. Um, source, where the breach was, so if it was Apollo or if it was Marriott or Target or whatever, shows the source, and then it shows what data was compromised. Okay, so what hackers do, this is what we were talking about before, the weaponization of hacking. What hackers do now is they create these tools, and if you can go and get all the email addresses of every employee at Graham and Dunn, and then they do these, they try to pull all this data from sources across the dark web, and then they only focus on the ones that say password. Okay, there's a lot of information here. There's your, your address, how many kids you have, your net income, all sorts of inf interesting information, but none of it accounts except the passwords. Okay, it comes down to something very basic, right? How many passwords do you have? How many passwords do you have in the world? I use the same password for every two yeah. accounts. Is that the smart password? 10, right? Okay. Like whatever, whatever, 20, who cares, okay? The point is this brain that we all have is only capable of remembering so many things, right? So we're all, we all operate as best we can and, and as, get as many com, like, unique passwords as we can get. So what they do is they do credential stuffing, okay? So they take, I'm gonna make this up because we can't see it, but that, that third oh, line down, that fourth line down is John Lovell. He's an he's a, uh, insurance producer in Kansas City, okay? We know that Kansas City is the hub for Southwest Airlines. I'm making that up. Um, we know that he's an insurance professional and he's traveling all over the Midwest, so he probably has an Avis account. He probably has a Hilton account. He has an Uber account. He has, what's the biggest bank in, in Kansas City? Um, UB. Yeah, UB, right? Or UMB, whatever. It, like, they, create, they, create all, <laughs> they create this profile for John Lovell. They have no idea who he is. They don't care. They create this profile. They, they fill in, just automatically drag and drop all the different websites that this, and accounts this person might have. Aetna is the biggest healthcare provider in Kansas City. I'm making that up. Okay, and then they take that 
email address and that password and they click a button and it takes about one one hundredth of a second and that algorithm plugs that email address and password into 50 different websites that this person may or may not use. And guess what? They get into half of them. Okay? Think about that for a second. You're like, oh, who cares? It's not my bank account. It doesn't matter. It's, it's, there's, it's a Southwest account. His wife's on there. His kids are on there. Date of birth is on there. Their ID is on there. If they're TSA approved, my there's all sorts of information. On there. I mean, like now, now and, and not only that, now they know where the Lovell family's going. Now they can socially engineer. Now they can make up a story to send back to Joe and say, hey, it's John, I'm with my family. We got stranded in Mexico, we got held up, I need some money. And so sure enough, he looks at, he knows that, he knows because of, because of his out of office, he knows that it, the Lovell family's in, in Cancun. Makes perfect sense, so he gets out 50 grand and sends it to an account in Thailand. He doesn't know anybody, he's trying to help his, his, his buddy. I okay. could probably count That's 10, called, 10 different uh, absolutely, absolutely. clients we that all, have had somebody yeah. send me credit card numbers or it's, whatever. It, it's, like, it's called credential stuffing and they will spend one day going through this, not even, one morning going through every one of these accounts till they, till they get the information they want and then they start to socially engineer. Then they start to ask for money to be sent, invoices, false uh, POSs, PO, like it's just a whole world that they can get into now because now they see what you're doing. Now they have, they've compromised you, okay? That's very powerful. We identify every single account that has a password exposed and we notify you as the insurer. What does that mean they have a password exposed? So that, that means someone got the password for that when I, when I So when I show someone that, yeah. and it shows that email address, yeah. and it shows they need to change their password immediately. Correct. When, when I told you I helped start this business, I was pretty skeptical because um, A, I didn't know anything about cyber insurance. And Josh, who was, a, who was CIA out of, out of high school, one of the youngest people ever recruited from CIA, um, he, he's like, Shay, let me, let me help you understand it. And I was working at JLT, which is a big insurance broker at the time. And he's like, well, what's your email address at JLT? And he puts it in, we're sitting in Starbucks in San Francisco. And I'm like, oh, it's shay.mcnamara at jltus.com. Uh, and he's like, he turns his laptop, Types in, turns the laptop around it, and my password is in bold print right across the, his screen. And he's like, is this your password? And I was like, I don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> how do you know that? And he's like, that took me, you know, a quarter of a second. He's like, because you use the same password as you did with your LinkedIn. And I was like, yeah. He's like, LinkedIn was breached three years ago. You should have changed your password. I was like, I can't remember all those passwords. <laughs> and he's like, well, oh. use technology, right? So, so that's all of us, right? That's every human being. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. right? <laughs> so, so that's that's what convinced me to to really that there that something needs to be done. Yeah. And so, what's also cool yeah. too, like you can actually see the people, and you won't be able to see it here, but yeah, like you can see the domains that some of your employees are visiting too, where those passwords were. Well, yeah, Not correct. Nice, yeah. I'll, t correct. I'll tell a little story. We we had one, we we did this on one client, and Ashley Madison was on one, and so we're like, do not give that to the client. It will not go well. That guy will be fired, probably. <laughs> so we did so, that. And that's a restaurant, you guys, with two pages of employee. And it's only the first. And it's only like the through the alphabet of A. Yeah. Right, because yeah, you yeah. only do so many of them. That's so right. there's probably way more that aren't visible in this report. Correct. So this is just a handful of them. And then on the next page, and this is this is the important piece, probably the most vulnerable piece. But again, it's hard to see here, but this is technical vulnerabilities. Okay, so everything that we can see that touches your your network. So if you're running Magento, which is an e-commerce software, if you're running PayPal on your site, if you're running through GoDaddy as your host provider. If you're running um, various types of server communication, WordPress is, a, is like a website design software. Any of these things, we see them because they're touching the web. If you're running Sonos or your industrial control systems and stamping the rubber mats, if it's connected to the web, we see it, okay? It's just the way the, the, the network works. We see these things and we match vulnerabilities with whatever we see running. And it, this one is in red, you can't see it again, but let's just say that that's the, this is the, tar let's say this is target, okay? They were running the um, Apache Struts software, and it would be red because we know it's vulnerable. The government out of Boulder, Colorado, actually, the National Institute of Standards, tracks every one of these vulnerabilities that, that are identified by hackers around the world every day. Okay, so you can actually click on this vulnerability for this um, Apache Struts software version 4.5 point whatever it is, and it'll tell you exactly what it is. 
and how it works and where it came from and when it was invented and all this other stuff. And we'll show you how to, how to fix it, okay? So this company, it, it, says, it says no active exploit, meaning the, com the software company, let's just say it's Apache again, fit, created a patch to fix that vulnerability the minute that they found out about it. But often, sadly, it takes 24 hours, 40 hours a week to come up with a patch for a hack that was created around the world. So, so we're helping you uh, understand what exposures you've got before you even know you've got them in many cases. And we certainly don't expect everybody to be like on IT level like, like Shay here, here is. Well, but those are school. things that uh, they're like in the client dashboard they're monitoring that they're sending you that as easy as like clicking a button and looking at it and saying here's how you yeah. fix it. So I mean that's yeah. the other thing. It's such a, like, I mean you can go down so many rabbit holes in this industry and, right. and, and get very confused and convoluted but make it easy for people to understand those risks and then, and then protect themselves against those risks uh, is one of the, the better, it, it's the most intriguing piece of this to me is the, the continual mon monitoring and making people aware of, 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 of problems or issues that are there. And then these are just more, um, these are just more uh, bullet points and things that uh, related to, to the account when we ran that quote. And like I said, it literally, it took uh, you know a couple minutes to, type that in and for them to figure all that out. So it's, it's pretty fascinating. And this was the actual quote that came back for that account. So um, when you get that assessment, it also shows you what it would cost to do that. Um, and it, like, I think this one was like 1500 bucks or something for the million dollars of coverage. I mean, it, it's a small amount of money um, for a really proactive uh, group that's ensuring your risk all the way through uh, for all the different, all the different, um, you know, first party, third party, all the different coverage that you guys have there. So, I won't, I know we've still got open bar till seven, and I don't want you guys to <laughs> miss out on that. Um, Can I ask a question, John? Yes, please. Um, are there specific customers that you would not accept, like for instance at Liberty Mutual, we will not take um, credit card processing companies, we will not offer cyber liability for that, we will not offer cyber liability for um, title companies. So, we have specific limitations on what we have just because of that risk factor. We're not, yep. we are not near as sophisticated as you. It's an add-on coverage for us, mm -hmm. a courtesy yeah. coverage more, more or less. So yeah. I'm just curious if there's things that scare you guys. No, that's a great question. Uh, and you're, and you're, you're absolutely right. Payment processes are a nightmare. Um, data aggregators are a nightmare. Um, adult entertainment's a nightmare. Casinos and gaming, terrible risks. Uh, we, we would love to, but we're not allowed to write cannabis. Cannabis is a great business, in our opinion. But our, our carrier who reinsures us doesn't agree. So they're Swiss, you know, they're still kind of figuring that out. I thought they were just cool, man. Yeah, they're, yeah, <laughs> no, just blaze it up. Everything's right? perfect over yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. Everybody makes the so, same um, Yeah, so we, we, we agree. Like, and, and there are businesses which we will get that? insure, right? Um, so, like, so we'll do cryptocurrency. But only if they're good risks, right? If they're if they're to, uh, coin token, which is too big for us, but let's just say they're they're the leader in cryptocurrency exchange. We know that every hacker on earth wants to hack them, so we're not going to write it. They're what's called a target of opportunity, or sorry, a target of choice. Mm -hmm. Target of opportunity is the low hanging fruit, like small businesses. Target of choice are really cool things that everybody knows about that they want to hack. Shit. So, can you explain how a uh, cyber ransom occurs? Yeah. yeah. So the most common one is yeah. uh, lately. It's, I, is that the most common, like the, the ransom? I mean, most. It's it's up there. It's it's more and more frequent, and and then funds transfer, for, uh, fraudulent funds transfer yeah. is another big one. So the ransom is them actually taking control of the system and then asking you, what was the example yeah. you were just. Yeah. Using? So we had an event uh, with an insured out in California. They're a media company, and they did like um, they helped build websites and and design websites for customers. They were a relatively small company. I think they were about 20 million in, in revenue, um, 100 employees, mostly programmers. They'd never bought cyber insurance before, and um, they became an insured of ours. And sadly, like a month later, Joe, you'll, you'll uh, get a kick out of this, but they had a massive ransomware. Uh, even though they scanned really well, and, and we were all kind of surprised, um, and it turned out somehow that they had literally got the, there's a screen and it's a, it's like every malware has the same screen. And it's like, it's like, it's really like 1980s style computing. It's very low end. And it shows, you know, like you've been 
um, you know, hacked, and this is whatever malware, and it, they give the name of it. And then it, there's a clock ticking at the bottom, and it's like, you have 48 hours to pay us 1,000 Bitcoin, or we'll destroy all of your data. Now, in any situation like this, um, some of you may be familiar with this in like the kidnap ransom world, in the, in the crime world, organized crime world, but you have to have what's called proof of life. Okay, we cover this. This is insured. This is insured. Sometimes, in fairness to the good guys on the, on the side of uh, on the team, we can, we can decrypt. Okay, you can use backups. That's, what, that's why backups are important, because you can say, take my data, I don't care, because I've got it all backed up. Screw you, I'm not paying you anything, right? Which we would all love to do. The problem is backups don't always work. Backups were two days ago when they backed up. The backup is not plugged in. The backup um, is corrupted with the same virus anyway, right? There's all these little complications you run into. We sent one of our main security guys out there, a guy who's been doing security um, out of DC for government agencies of all sorts for 25 years. He shows up. You first need to find out proof of life. What it, are, is it, are these high school kids down in Overland Park toying with this insured? Maybe, maybe not. Sure enough, he does some research. We have our NSA guys look at it. It's the North Korean, it's the government, it's North Korea. Okay, and they're just out fishing and hunting for ways to make money. And so we're like, well, we can't decrypt it. There's no way around it. This is a legitimate hacking effort. So we just need to pay it, right? But we, we're not gonna pay until we know that they actually have the data. How do you know, right? What if you pay them and they, your data still blows up? You don't know. So you have to do proof of life. And what we do is we say to them, hey, send us this volume, right? Because we can see from backups and stuff what, what volumes are where and names of files and all this stuff. And we say, hey, send us this volume and this file. And if you do, then you actually know what you're doing and unlock it for us. And they did. And they were perfectly cordial and perfectly polite over, you know, over the, over the ether. And, uh, and so we're like, well, now we gotta. Kim Jong Un back there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's like, he's like this. You know? um, and so uh, that was that was confidential. What is a thousand? <laughs> what is a thousand bit? Top secret. Uh, well, it, well, it fluctuates by eighty percent a week, so you never know. Kind well, what was it? I mean, what was that loss? I mean, that's. Uh, it was a few hundred, yeah, hundred grand. Yeah. yeah. It's expensive. But what's, but so when that incident happens, they're in. Like you guys. We're in. We're literally on the ground. Over. We're, we're 36 people today. Uh, we were four people two years ago. We want to have 3,600 in the next few years to be able to go do this stuff and solve the problem. Because that's important, right? Company, that's the company, that literally was the company teetering on a thread of whether they were going to exist or not. And we ended up having to pay the Bitcoin, which by the way also is not simple because yeah. you can't just send money to North Korea in case any of you have ever thought about what the State Department feels and how they feel about that. Um, so like, it's complicated, we paid it, everything's fine, all the data was unlocked, and then the irony, not the irony, the disgusting part of it was they actually sent to the, to the insured, to the company, they sent a follow-up email being like, thanks for that, uh, would you mind giving us a review? <laughs> and the insured was like, a review of what? And they're like, well, that we, that we did exactly what we said we were gonna do. We were great. We were really ethical hackers. And they're like, are you kidding me? And there's a whole world, and Jessica and I were joking about it earlier, but there's a whole world because if, if you as a hacker aren't, aren't credible for your threat of, of deleting or paying, you're not gonna be very successful as a hacker. If you though, of course, have a really good track record of unlocking the data and paying or giving everything back after you've been paid, then people will pay you, right? It's, it's per, yeah. When you take your, your emotional brain off and turn on your rational brain, it makes perfectly good yeah, sense. That's what I said, like how do you, how do you trust these guys that's to right. turn the data over? It's like, because if they don't, they'll never be able to do this Correct. again. That's right. Now they have been marked by you guys yeah. and everyone else, and they yeah. know that these guys are credible, they know what they're doing, and yeah. yes, we're probably gonna pay them. And now every other time they go do it, it's, yeah. it's like, yeah, these are, these are credible hackers, and, right. and, so legit. and we're, gonna, we're gonna. And, and actually, just so you know, this is important, we're not, I mean, we're an insurance company, we want to make money. We don't want to pay all of our money away, but like we did the math and it was a lot cheaper to pay the Bitcoin in, within a 24 hour period than it is for our insured to go battle and unlock and decrypt and basically go out of business because that would be really expensive. Do you have a question? Yeah, so, so once that breach happens and you do negotiate, you pay the money, that wormhole is sealed up. What's, what's the yeah, that's, that's, that's part of the that's part of the proof of life. 
you make right. sure that everything's there's no back door. They call it back door, right? Where yeah, so what do you do there. after that incident to go in and make sure that yeah, you find it? Because they would have to do the yeah. forensic analysis. Yeah. And Correct, and that's all paid for. That's all covered. Right. Right. Because forensics and incident response is all covered for each response. So uh, we make sure there's nothing there. Can you guys, and it was fine. Can you guys tell, like when you jumped in there and that, and have to go against this, did you like know where, did you already know where the breach occurred? Like how they got in there to get that? We did, but we had to get access to the network because we can't go into the network without their approval. That's why we flew out and we're like, let's just sit down and go through this. Right. They opened up everything and they're like, whatever you need to do. Please and so. we very quickly figured out when the breach occurred, how it was done. They'd been in there for like 180 days. Mm. Oh. I mean, it, it's just, it's fascinating. And, so and if it, they're in there that long, they've already, they've already attacked your backup. More right, than that's right. That was the yeah. problem. Yeah. Well, they, they had no backup. I mean, yes, they had backup, but it was as corrupt, and they could lock that up too, even if we re, reinstated it, right? Yeah. So and, and, how do you go check the data after they return it that it's... Yeah, we, we do, yeah, we check it all, and we go through it all, and everything was there, so... Yeah, and, mo and most yeah. most insurance companies have a third party that does that service. Where Coalition yep. is the company providing that right. service, yeah, so, so they have a vested interest to mitigate the claim as low and as best as possible for you as a client. Which is yeah, is, that's one of our not, that our, doesn't happen in the industry. We have in house ex experts on this sort of thing, so we can do it really fast and really solve the problem. Whereas, as Dwayne was saying, a lot of other carriers outsource it, and it takes a day or two or three because you've got to get a privacy a, a breach coach lawyer who has client attorney privilege and then they get the forensics teams and then they get the you know remediation teams and it's a longer process but it was but if you think about how insurance works it's like when they break into a new market or new industry see you guys thank you yeah. thank you oh, see you guys very informative family commitment oh, right. thank right. you right. thanks guys thanks. appreciate uh, it but i think with this would be just wrap it up with this but um I just lost my train of thought. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what were we just talking about? We were talking about back doors, data protection, um, ransomware. I've I lost it. it was, so go ahead. Another question that I have is, so we sometimes offer cyber liability coverage as a part of a BOB or part of a business owner's package or part of a, uh, it, it's just thrown in. It's a thrown in coverage. So how do you guys handle a situation where you're you know, John, has, you guys are providing coverage, and so are we. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, our limits are probably a quarter million, maybe maybe a million, depending on the cost of Well, I'll take it. We usually would just have it pulled out. Yeah, so yeah. I say, so we, sometimes it's free, sometimes you buy it. Yeah. But how do you guys do when you've got dual coverages? I mean, we'd love, to have, primary. You, we'd love to have you jump yeah. right in, because we yeah. don't have the capabilities that you do. So, I yeah. Yeah, it depends on how it occurred, right? So if it's if it's property based, if it's manufacturing based, if it's service, if it's if it's all data security and it's like email ransomware, then it's it's kind of our bag, right? Okay. Um, but generally, how those work, I haven't we haven't seen one of those yet. What you do will contribute. I can tell you that. Well, that's yeah. that's actually what it comes that often yeah. is like your claim soaks and our claim soaks sit down and be like, okay. Let's figure this out together. You guys take 30, we take 70, and it's, and it's solved. The insured and broker hopefully never have to deal with any of that. Oh, yeah, and hopefully in that situation, let's take care of the matter first, and then we'll figure it out on the back. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, let's not let insurance get in the way. Yeah. He said they paid What a surprise. So. Liberty Mutual yeah. had software issues. Oh, well, I, mean, I think that's, uh, so I do, I do know yeah. what I was just saying. It, 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 well, this would be a it was, it was talking about how they are, um, they're also there doing the, the uh, assessment and handling the, the, the breach and, and the forensic yeah. analysis, all those things that are typically outsourced. But you have to understand, it's like that's typically how it's done in the insurance world. And so when they jumped into the cyberspace, they're just like, oh, we'll just do it the same way that we do those. I mean, when you have a, a loss, you might have a claims adjuster, but who comes and fixes it? You know, it's another, you know, you're hiring a contractor or whatever you come do yeah. it, roof gets damaged. Yep. And so they thought that process was the same over there. It's like, well, we'll insure it, and then something happens, we'll just have this group do it or whatever. And so can you imagine, I mean, I can't even imagine, like if you were with one of those carriers that didn't have that response team, and you were being, uh, you were being held ransom, like what would you be doing? And so um, my guess is that, you know, that, that process right there, and that's why they're thinking of it kind of like full circle and, and changing the way uh, this business or this risk is being underwritten and, and, and covered. Yep. It is by actually 
being in it and being proactive and actually coming from that space. And so that's that's where this ends up being uh, a viable option, not just you know now, but but moving forward and really making all the other groups either play catch up or figure out a way to in, you know implement some of those those uh, programs that you guys are doing, which you know, yeah. I don't know if we'll end up being able to do or not. So. Yeah. Um, that's it. If anybody else has any more questions, we've got like a, we've got like 35 minutes still left at the oak bar. We do have a new rooftop upstairs that I want to go check out. This is an architectural wonder. It's a pretty cool space, and uh, that just opened. It is architectural wonder, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's a it's a hall. Hall. Yeah. Yeah. crossroads. Uh, uh, <laughs> anyway, so I, I want to thank Shay Number One for coming in from San Francisco. Uh, thank you guys. I want to thank you guys for coming down here. Uh, and, and listening to some insurance stuff, uh, I, you know, this isn't meant to sell or scare. It's meant to just make you aware of some of the things that are going on, and the fact that we're constantly looking for partners like this uh, to rethink how things are done, rethink how things are underwritten, and give you guys a better return on your insurance program. So, thank you, Shay. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Dwayne. Thank you, guys, all for coming. If there aren't any more questions, then eat some more food, grab some more drinks, and uh, cue the music.